Good morning once again. My name is still Bill Boleyn, and I'm still glad to be with you this morning. And I want to begin with this word. I want to, uh, I want to commend you, and I want to bless you for your faithfulness in worship. This is such an important part of our faith journey, isn't it? Gathering in God's house and lifting up our worship and praise to him. It nourishes our spirits. It really does. It pleases God. And then uh, sometimes we take it out of here, too. It's a part of, not just it's good uh, in our spiritual journey, but it's part of our witness, too. Oh, look, look at how they sing. And then they take it out of the building. So tomorrow, sing some of these songs at work. Hum Amazing Grace, okay? Let it go out of the building. Bless your hearts for being here. I'm greeting you in the room, you out in the atrium, over in the CLC. If you're watching online right now or watching later, we had 845 people watch online last weekend. So there's a whole congregation out there watching, all right? Would you, I want to get us on topic. Would you take your program in hand? I want to show you something there in just a second, okay? Let's get on topic. How many of you are like me and you admire, have a deep appreciation for people who can build things? Yes? I can build a snowman. I can build a root beer float. I can build a complex sentence, okay? But if I get a hammer in my hand, I'm just going to hurt myself. That's what's going to, I just don't have that aptitude. And so I like people who can take a plan. By the way, look at the front of your program, okay? That is just a snippet, but it's an actual portion or snippet of our Shakopee blueprint or plan. That's what's happening out there. And I want to talk about it a little bit later, okay? It's exciting. But I like it, you know, people that can take a blueprint or a plan and they know what materials to order and, and in what order this thing's going to be built and they can make it happen, okay? Now, that's just one of the reasons, yet another reason why I admire and I'm in awe of and I love God Almighty, God the Father, because he is the master designer and creator and architect of the whole universe, isn't he? The Bible says that from cover to cover, front to back. I could show it to you in any number of places. A little bit later, in just a few moments, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. So I just want to show you one verse that I have come upon in the book of Nehemiah. This is running ahead a little bit, but let me just show it to you. This is Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. It talks about what I'm, what I'm talking about, right? About God, the great designer or builder. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and seas and everything in them. You preserve them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. Is that kind of, I don't know, do you take a deep breath? Isn't that uplifting? That's who God is. Everything that we see, the whole universe and all the stars, everything, everybody we see in this room, he created it all, okay? And he, does, he, he really does good work. Would you agree with me? Then then you'd have to agree with me on this, that the very best work that he does is you and me. We're created in his image. Again, we can find this any number of places in the Bible. We're the jewel or the crown in his creation. We really are. In the margin of your, of your sermon notes, would you just write down uh, Psalm 8? You're gonna, you might want to go there later. Maybe you need a little boost in the week. Also write down Psalm 139. You can read up on yourself in the Bible. Here's a few verses from Psalm 8. I'm just going to pick it up at verse 3. When I consider your heavens, this is just what we read about, just what we talked about. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. And yet, verse 5, and yet... You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hand. You put everything under their feet. Who is he talking about? He's talking about you, Bubblicious, okay? And I know, I know what you saw when you got up and looked in the mirror this morning, and it wasn't pretty, but you still are a work of God created by his hand. It says that in Psalm 139. And the thing is, it's not like you are a car that came off the assembly line. He created you, you came off the line, you're done, you're gone, good luck, and next year's model will be a little bit fancier. That's not how it is, okay? Because God continues to stretch and grow and uh, counsel and correct and fill and restore and renew and bless us and more. He just does until when? <laughs> Until he calls you home, that's when. And only then will you be a finished, final work forever. Meanwhile, he's got his hands on us, 
And what we're talking about here at Hosanna is we're under construction, and things are happening here. And I just, I think, folks, honestly, as a person of faith, I believe this. This is one of the things that keeps us young and keeps us full of life and, and vitalized, a sense of vitality. Because we don't get up every morning and say, oh, man, it's just another day. No, no. We're talking about being people of God. And we get up in the morning, and he's got fresh manna for us. He's got new things to show us and places to take us, okay? So this sermon series, Under Construction, Ryan gave us a great start last week. You can watch that message online. And he got us focused on our theme verse for this sermon series, Under Construction, and it's Philippians 1, verse 6. Uh, class, eyes up here, okay? On the board? Let's read it together, class, okay? Philippians 1, verse 6, and we read together... And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Amen. Okay? What's it saying? Just let your mind settle on those words. God's doing something in your life. He's begun it. It's happening right now, and he's going to see it through to completion. You can't stop him. I mean, why, why would you want to? I don't know, but you can't stop him. He's going to see it through. And so that's what we're talking about. That's why we're here, so that God can do this work in us and through us, yes? And let me just set this again in context, remind you what's going on here. Last, last month, we had this sermon series, No Perfect People Allowed. We just said, everybody's in. We, we stand on level ground in the, in the midst of God's grace. No perfect people allowed. So that was the sense of welcome. Write this down in your sermon notes. We're moving now from the welcome to the why. God has invited us in. He's welcomed us here. We need to ask sometimes, okay, why? Why am I here? What's he up to? And I want to take you into the story, the Bible story that we're focusing on, and then I'm going to show you how it relates to our story, yours and mine, okay? Would you turn in your Bibles to um, Nehemiah, and you're going to go to chapter 3. If you're in one of these Red Worship Center Bibles, it's on page 290, Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, again, Ryan gave us a, a snippet of history last week, and it was good. In 586 B.C., Jerusalem, the city, and, and the, including the temple, destroyed. And the Israelites, God's chosen people, they're hauled off to distant lands, okay? They went into exile. And now as this part of the story unfolds, they're, they're coming back. One wave has come back. A second wave has come back. Nehemiah is about to, to bring a third wave back. Now, he's got a job. He's serving the king over in Persia. And what's his job? He's serving the king Tobin James, okay? Are you with me? He, he tastes it so that it's not poison before he hands it to the king. Let me see, king, your majesty. Let me just check. Ooh, that's, let me, let me check again. Okay, make sure it's okay. He's got a job, but God's got something else in mind for him. And he's calling them back to Jerusalem, the holy city. Why? To reconstruct the wall. It's a mess. It's a shambles there. So the construction is just about to begin. And this is where we pick it up in verse 3 now. There's going to be special focus on the gates, all right? This is Nehemiah 3, verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate. Take note of that, okay? We'll come back to that. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and the Tower of Hananael. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zakur, son of Imri. The fish gate, there's another gate, okay? The fish gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Now we're going to pause there, because there's a thought in the room. Can, do you feel it? And the thought is this, at least for some of you. Oh, my. Pastor Boleyn is so smart. Because he can pronounce all those names just so wonderfully. <laughs> he must have gone to school for years to get that, okay? Let me let you in on a little secret. We'll just get clear on this. Most of us pastors, we don't know how to pronounce those names either, but we read them boldly and with authority. <laughs> because nobody stands up to correct us. So why am I telling you that? Because, because when you're in this, your small group this week and somebody asks you to read this, don't go out all wimpy and whiny. Well, you've got big words here. Just... Read boldly and with peace on your face, and, and they'll say, wow, okay? <laughs> uh, all right, the, the, uh, we're, we're beginning to build the wall around the city, special focus on the gates. 
And we just saw two of them. In your small groups, we're going to ask you to kind of go through chapter 3, and you will see that there are 10 gates named there. And each one has special meaning. It has theological meaning. What do I mean by that? Theos is God. Theology is the study of God. So if something has theological meaning, it, it gives us insight into how God works, okay? So let's just take a little stroll around the walls. We'll just do this for the next couple of moments, okay? Starts with the sheep gate. And th these are all in your sermon notes. Starts with the sheep gate. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel knew that the lamb had to be slaughtered and its blood placed on the doorposts in Egypt for them to be set free. Okay, the angel of death passed over. It's called the Passover. That, that lamb was slain and they were set free. They knew that. When Jesus came down to the waters of the River Jordan, John the Baptist pointed at him and, and said what? Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, okay? So the spiritual journey, it begins with the Lamb, or that's what we're talking about, the sheep gate. It begins with Jesus, okay? Then the next gate is, is the fish gate. What does that gate mean? It means when you, when, you're, when you see who Jesus is, he comes along, and he invites you to, follow. come on, I'll show you things. I'll take you places, and I will make you fishers of men and women, okay? I've got a plan for you. That's what the fish gate is all about. And then comes the old gate. Once you started to follow Jesus, you start to set the old stuff down, the old ways of seeing things, the old ways of thinking about things, and then, and then new thoughts come. Whoever's in Christ is a new creation, right? And then comes the valley gate. When they were out in the valley, the Israelites knew that they had to dig deeper, you know, to find this fresh water, the living waters. And that's what we're doing as we go into God's word. We just sang about that. Take me deeper where my feet would not go because you want to make me stronger. Beautiful song, okay? And that's what happens there. At the, that's what the valley gate is all about. And then we come to the dung gate. Say it again. The dung gate. What do you suppose happens there? <laughs> this is where they take out the trash, okay? You got a wall around the city. You don't want the trash inside the city, so you designate a gate. You take the trash out. And as Christians on this spiritual journey following Jesus Christ, we need to do that too. Whatever is separating us from God's love and from following Jesus, whatever is stinking up our lives, if you will, take it out. That's what the dung gate is all about, okay? Now it starts to get better because we're going around the wall and we get to the fountain gate. And this is focusing on the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? We don't have to do this on our own. God's going to come alongside of us and give us the power to do it. A couple weeks ago, Nancy and I left our cabin, walked up two, three doors where they're building a pretty cabin up there. And it's early in construction, and so the generator is running. The generator is running so that they can have power for construction. Just a picture, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Power of the Holy Spirit. And then the water gates, focus is still on the, on the Holy Spirit, but it's just not the power that's out there. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that God wants that, the Spirit to take up residence in us. And when that happens, folks, now we start to experience, now we get a taste of peace and joy and confidence and self-control. It's getting good now, right? But then comes uh, the horse gate. Horses were used in spiritual warfare. This isn't a cakewalk this spiritual journey. And there will be forces that come up against us. We are involved in spiritual warfare. We need, to be a, we need to be aware of that. And that's what that gate is about. Then we get to the east gate. The sun rises in the east. This gate reminds us that not unlike the rising sun, we are to let our light shine by our good works and our deeds. And so we are to bless other people. And then it brings us finally to the uh, last gate, the inspection gate. This has to do with numbering. When the saints go marching in, where do you want to be? Oh, I want to be in that number, okay? This is the glory gate when God finally reviews us and, and we're on our way to heaven and, and we've gone all the way around the wall and it brings us back to the sheep gate. Any spiritual journey begins and ends with Jesus Christ, yes? Isn't this interesting? It's not, is it? I mean, let's be honest. I can tell by the way you're looking at me. Is I'm, I'm glad you're not going on about this stuff because it's not very interesting. Until you go a little deeper, okay? And there, it, it reveals stuff to us about God, okay? Would you write this down? With God, there is always order. He's not a God of confusion or, or a God of choice. He does have a plan. And there was a progression here as I kind of walked around. You start with Jesus, and then you follow him, and then you start to lay the old stuff down. And then you, you take out the trash. And all those things I said, there's a, there's a plan here. There's order to it. There's order in God's creation. 
Now look at me, folks. I, I, when we say this up front, we, we know this, we feel it sometimes, that when we say God has a plan for your life, some of you, that, you, you wrestle with that because you almost take it too literally. Well, I, you know, did God plan that I should wear these socks and, and sit in that chair and part my hair on the right or left side? N not exactly. That's not what we're talking about, T to say God has a plan, okay? God has this plan for you and this desire for you. Listen, that you, my friend, would come to see yourself as a child of God, that you would walk in that confidence and that assurance and be pleased with that and that relationship that you would know what your unique gifts are, one of a kind in the world, and, and how to use those gifts to glorify God and to serve other people. Let all of that simmer for a minute, okay? This is what he wants for you. Know yourself as a child of God. Know your gifts. You're one of a kind. And you, and you live this out in such a way that you glorify him and serve other people. Now, within that, there's a lot of freedom of choice, okay? There really is. Uh, we had a... Um, we had a pastor's team meeting on Monday. And as part of our, part of our opening devotional time, I said, Let, let's talk about when, uh, what was a season of struggle for you in your spiritual journey? And the pastors are very candid, and the story started coming. And we talked for a while. And, and here's the thing. The, the thread or the theme that was in common for all of us pastors kind of was this. Well, I started out doing my own thing, and, and I, and I kind of had a plan, and I kept saying, God, bless this plan. What are you thinking of this, God? Isn't, aren't I something? And I would bump into things, or I would trip over things, or I'd come into a season of struggle, and I realized in that season of challenge, I realized I really hadn't asked him if he had something else in mind. You know, submitting our plans to his. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, God's got a plan. God is a God of order. And then uh, when you're in your small groups and you're, and you're looking at uh, chapter 3, you'll, you'll focus on verses 17, 18, 19, and the ones I've laid out for you, and you'll see that phrase again and again next to him. So-and-so is building this gate. Lots of friends around him. But then next to him was so-and-so, and next to him was so-and-so. And I'm sorry, in a way, that it's also male-centric. There were women and children involved in this construction. They really were. But that phrase, next to him and next to him and next to him, write down the word partnership. That's what this is about, okay? We, we are not to do this alone. Just had a partnership class uh, ended two weeks ago. We got another 125 people that want to be partners with us in this ministry. And, and the thing is, folks, we need each other. At least for two reasons, way more, but for encouragement and for accountability. Big words in a Christian journey, okay? We need each other. We can lift each other up when someone falls or when they're hurting, and we can call others back when they've gone astray. And so we have this conversation I used to have in confirmation class. Can you be a Christian and not go to church? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can read the Bible. I can sing prayer. Yes, you can, Bubblicious. But here's the thing. Only in the church can you be a member of the body of Christ. That's who we are. Only here. And it's really something. Okay? Now, there's more to the story. Shay's going to come along next week and, and talk about when, you know, what, what, when things come up against us, when there's opposition, we have to struggle. What's God up to then? And he's going to be all over that message. Okay? But let's relate this now to our story and to your Monday morning. You've heard this, you hear this any number of times. That you are welcome here at Hosanna and that the Lord has led you here. And we mean it. H hearing that and, and believing that's true, you're welcome here and the Lord has led you here, doesn't that lead you to this question, okay, why? <laughs> why am I here? What did he bring me here for? What's going on? Okay? I read a book just this last week called Mission Drift. Don't write it down. Don't go buy it. You don't need it, okay? It's not in the bookstore. Mission Drift. Here's the, here's the essence of it. Author says that there are any number of organizations that start out with a Christian focus, a clearly stated purpose or mission statement. And then, as can happen, over the years, they drift from that. They drift from that. That's the mission drift. And they become something entirely different. Young Man's Christian Association. Ever heard of it? Yeah. YMCA started in 1844 for the express reason, the express reason, of bringing young men out of the ghettos, out of the slums, off the street into a safe place where they could be trained up with Bible study and with prayer. That's how it started, okay? 2010, four years ago, YMCA became what? 
You'll never hear why I'm saying, yeah, you might. It's called the why. And, and why do you go to the why? It's all about fitness now because that's how they make their money. Look at me, folks. I'm not saying that in a condemning way. The why is a great place. A lot of you are going there. You've never looked better. Mostly this side of the room. I'm not sure what's with you guys. But, you know, you, you go there and, you get, and some of you are on the board at the Y. It's a good thing. I'm just saying, that's not what it was, you know, how it started. They've drifted from that. In 1636, a university was started for the express purpose of training up people to uh, preach the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why they came together. The name of that university is Harvard University. Okay. A Christian voice and Christian groups can hardly have their say at, on that university campus right now. It's an extraordinary academic institution, but it's strayed a long ways from where they began. That's what I'm saying, okay? And so to avoid this mission drift, we have to come back to the why from time to time. And let me ask you this. Why are you here? Why are you here? Do you think about that from time to time? How would you answer that? Well, I want to expose my kids to faith. I mean, I love the music here. All my friends are here. Pastor Bullion is wonderful. All these are good reasons. If we went back to the founder of the church, not me, if we went back to Jesus, he would probably have you answer it this way. Would you write it down? To love God and to love others. Okay? To love God and to love others. Is that why you are here? Is, is that how you would have answered that? Listen, folks. The Lord wants... I love this thought. The Lord wants to develop in each one of us a supernatural capacity. In other words, he's going to do the work. He'll give it to us. A supernatural capacity to know and to love him more and to love and to serve other people more. Let that simmer on your mind, okay? To know and to love him more and to love and serve others more. Okay, that's why we are here. Is, is that how you would have answered that question? You know, if I were to say, you know, mark your paper now, what, what letter grade would you give yourself? I'm not here to, to mark your paper and, and flunk you out. You give yourself a grade, okay? But, but let's keep moving. We need to ask this question corporately as well, okay? Why are we here? Why are we here? Would you, would you write this down? To advance God's kingdom everywhere, one person at a time. Seems like I've heard that someplace before, okay? Class... Up on the screen, in a second, watch this. Mission statement for Hosanna Lutheran Church, okay? And we read it together. Advancing God's kingdom everywhere, one person at a time. That's how we say it. You can say it different ways, but that's what we're about. That's why we're here, okay? And believe me, folks, as we grow in our capacity to know and love God, to hear him, and we are, and as we love each other be, you know, better and deeper, the kingdom is advancing. And from time to time, I need to tell you that. And I need to tell you what God's doing here. And we need to celebrate it, okay? We had 130 people here all day yesterday for a Sozo workshop. And they're focusing on, and the Spirit's moving them in the direction of freedom in the name of Jesus Christ, okay? We had yesterday in this room, we baptized 50 babies. There were 800 people here to baptize 50 babies. Can you picture that? It's, you'd think it was just chaotic. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. And all my babies smiled at me, except for the one that threw up. But, it, but God was moving, okay? Uh, we got 65, 70 guys right now who are finishing their retreat up in Annandale, Minnesota. Men, and they're talking about building bridges to those who haven't heard the name of Jesus Christ yet. Jen showed you the picture of 385 young women, middle school girls, who were on retreat last weekend. You should have been here Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Okay, hundreds of students in here. Pastor Jared Van Voorst gets up and talks about forgiveness and reconciliation. And things start busting loose. Kids stand up and they start moving toward one another and shaking hands and hugging. And there were prayer groups all throughout the room. The Spirit of God moved on those kids. Yes. Now, okay. And there's miracles in here, miracles all the time. We got miracles, and we need to tell you these stories, and you need to pass it on, okay? Would you watch the screens for a moment? Hi, my name is Stacy, and I guess you could call me a runner. I've been running for five years with a pretty significant hip injury, which really messed with my running mechanics and caused me pain every day. I did everything possible in the medical realm short of surgery. 
physical therapy, strength training, massage, rehab, none of which helped long term. About six weeks ago, I went to the well, an evening of worship and prayer and renewal. There was a speaker teaching on healing prayer, which I was really excited to learn more about. My intention was to learn how I could pray more effectively for others, but God had something else in mind for me. A young woman laid hands on my hip and prayed for healing like we were being instructed. I didn't really think anything of it as I didn't notice anything different after she prayed. I went home and went to bed and slept completely through the night with no hip pain for the first time in many years. I woke up and thought to myself, wow God, thanks for the great night's sleep. I then ran five miles that morning completely pain free and have been running without pain ever since. God showed me in a big way that he wants the same healing and freedom for me that I have been praying for others. My running has become an act of worship, an intimate time between God and I where I listen to praise music and give him thanks and glory. I'm thankful for Hosanna's faith in the healing power of the Holy Spirit, for the young woman that stepped out in faith and prayed for my healing, but mostly to Jesus Christ, my Lord and King, and for how much he loves me. You like that, you like that smile at the end? Let's clap for God, okay? Uh, all that and more, all that and more is going on around here. How many of you used to say, uh, I don't want to go to church? I don't either. I don't want to go to church. I want to go hang out with the people of God and celebrate what God's doing amongst the people. Okay, it's really something. We're under construction here, and he's working on us, and he's working through us. The churchy word, the theological word for this business of being under construction is consecration. Hear it. You don't need to learn it, but that's what it is. Consecration means to be set apart for God's holy purposes. When we have communion, we consecrate the bread and the wine. We set them apart for the holy purpose of representing God's body and blood. Jesus got body and blood, really something. Even more so, this work of consecration is taking place in this congregation. And we're being set apart for God's holy purposes, part of his plan. That's why we're here. So in closing, let's just go over a couple things. God's plan begins with submission. Would you write that down, please? Submission. That's a tough word. But look at me, folks. This is how intimate relationships work. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Oh, yeah, Billy, tell him. Say it again, okay? <laughs> and this is for you, Bobby. This is the rest of it, okay? Wives, submit to your husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church and died for her. Holy mackerel. That's the whole picture. That's how relationships work. Submission and sacrifice, okay? And our only response to the sacrifice that's been made for us is that one, submission. It's just coming along and saying, gee whiz, I don't, I don't do a very good job at being God. I, I don't do it. I'm glad you are God and you are sovereign, and I'm glad you are my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I want to be a follower of yours, okay? In this business of submission, it, it does have to do with deciding. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Yeah, at some, place you, at some point, you've got to make a choice, or you've got to decide that. And I say this out of love, and we say this from time to time. There's some of you sitting here, ah, okay, okay, I like this place. I'm just not sure... You can sit on the fence if, that, if, that, if that's where you are, but we tell you from time to time, the devil owns the fence, and he'd be happy for you to stay there the rest of your life, okay? It's a dangerous place to be. God's plan starts with submission. Would you write this down? It also includes service. This is the best kept, un, uh, this is the best or greatest unkept secret in, in God's kingdom, and, and what is it? That you, my friend, will experience joy and purpose and a profound contentment in your life, you really will as you serve other people, okay? Everybody knows this, just not many ch people choose it. Who gets the gold in the kingdom of God? Whoever would be first, how's it go? Whoever would be first getting the gold, they must be last or be servant of all. Humble servants make for happy saints, truly. And I would ask you personally, maybe out in the atrium later, are you happy or are you just in a hurry? It's hard to be both, okay? Choose the joy and happiness of serving others. And then finally, write down that God's plan requires sacrifice. Well, shoot. <laughs> you 
This doesn't get any easier. It doesn't, but it gets better. It just gets better. You know, I say this, um, I think it, and I say it probably to Nancy, maybe to a few, a few others. Every four years, I say this, I'm not going to watch the Olympics for crying out loud. They're on for a million hours every night. I, yeah, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not going to watch them. And if I do, I'm not going to get hooked in like I always do. But then the other night, you know, <laughs> you just take a peek just to see what's going on. And what happens is, obviously, they start telling you the stories of these athletes from all over the world. And, and what they tell you is all about the price that they've paid to get here, all about the sacrifices that they have made to participate in the Olympics and, and represent their country. And you, yes, you just get drawn in. There's something about people who are willing to make a sacrifice that draws us in deeply. So sacrifice in the Olympics might lead to a gold medal. It might. Sacrifice in the kingdom of God leads to sanctification. When we are willing to, to let go of some of our selfish plans, when we are willing to set aside some of the possessions that virtually possess us, when we do that, that kind of sacrifice, then more and more we can become the sons and daughters that God has intended us to be. And that's why we're here. Now, look at those three words. Submission, service, sacrifice. Now, my friends, give yourself a letter grade, okay? What, you know, what would you give yourself for each one of those? And before you go there, because you're getting nervous, let me just tell you what to put at the top of your page, okay? Put the letter I down. I. Incomplete, okay? Just incomplete. Because he's not done with us yet. And we're under construction in this place. But meanwhile, meanwhile today, I hope and I trust that we have an ever greater clarity on what we're about, why we are here, why we're here, and what's required of us. And here's why this is so important, folks. I said this to the vision board a couple weeks ago. I said it at staff on Tuesday. I have felt this over the years a handful of times in the, in the course of the life of this congregation. We are there again. I feel it in my chest that God right now is putting things in place in this congregation. He's putting things in order and in alignment. Uh, he is sharpening our focus. He really is. And he's removing, he's protecting us, he's eliminating some of the noise and the distractions for us because he is preparing us for a breakthrough season, a breakthrough event. I don't know, I, don't, I wouldn't call it revival, I don't know that for sure, but what I know is that in this new season, in this new season, God will move even more powerfully among us. I know he will. And we will see things more clearly. We'll see what he's up to. And we will step into it with courage and with confidence. I'm declaring it this weekend at Hosanna. 2014 is going to be the best year of ministry ever for this congregation out of all 34. Would you please pray it in and pray it up? This is God's will for us, and we want to walk in alignment with his will. And you know what? One of the best things that's going to happen this year, one of the best things, and we need to start that party today, and we're going to. It's the Shakopee party. Yes, the Shakopee party, this is good. We're, we're knocking on the door over there. I was over there with some staff on Wednesday, and I'm just floating around, floating around on air over there. I'm so excited about this. The sign is up, Hosanna outside. Everybody can see it. The, the walls are painted. Wait till you see the colors. It just pops in there. You can look at the screens. The carpet's down. The interior signs are up so you can find where the bathrooms are. The furniture is being moved in. It's being put in place, and it's all ready for the people of God to show up, Okay. And this, too, I've felt a few times in the years at Hosanna. This, you know, this excitement of worshiping for the first time in a new venue. Oh, this is going to be good. Three weeks from today, March 2nd, is the day. Who should go to worship there? Not all of you. Not all of you, okay? <laughs> Here's the deal. One church. It's all Hosanna, two locations. But the idea is not to empty out this place and let's go make Shakopee look good. If, here's the ask... If you live within, I don't know, three, four, five miles of that location, 169 and Marshall, I would ask you to, to consider making that your worship site, your Hosanna home, and invite your friends in. We're, we're over there to make a difference in that community, not just to look good. That's not it. 
So March 2nd, we're going to worship at 9 and 11. And it's, it's the same worship. The message that is preached here will be seen over there. If I'm over there preaching or anybody, it will be telecast. But same thing. It's Hosanna all the way, okay? But here's the deal for all of you. Same day, March 2nd, 1 to 4 o'clock, you come to open house. I want you to see this. Mark it down. March 2nd, 1 to 4. It's in your bulletin, your program. Little Sunday afternoon drive. Come on over to Shakopee. And here's the last thing we got to do today. I want you to see the Shakopee team. We've got a core team of people that are stepping into this ministry at Hosanna, and then we're going to join the team, okay? So coming up on the platform right now is Shea Strickland. We've got Jen Alexander, April klein Walterink, Andrew Loftus, Kristen Wytosik, Jared Stearns, and David Larson. Don't clap yet, although you're dying to, okay? Just we got to take a look at him. See if they're good looking. What do you think? I think they are. These, not yet, not yet. Uh, yeah, I know, oh, we want to, though. <laughs> These are the anointed, appointed leaders, the core group that's going to Shakopee, okay? We're not going to bless them and launch them and say good luck, okay? They're just going to lead us in this new effort. And they've got the gifts. I mean, God's moving in this already, and it's really something. And so this morning, I wanted you to see them and be excited with them and let us as a congregation, their congregation, Hosanna, let's bless them, okay? Hand a blessing up for this team, okay? Lord, we, we thank you for uh, this Shakopee team. They do, they do make us smile, Lord, because they're amazing, one by one and, and then as a team. And you've wired them up and you've prepared them for this time and this new ministry. So, Lord, we pray for them we pray blessing and anointing. We pray your Holy Spirit upon and within them, Lord. Bring them favor. Bring them encouragement. Bring them wisdom. Bring them a great confidence that they're walking according to your will. We are partners with them, and we're excited, Lord. Wrap your arms around this team that their hearts might beat together as one. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's clap like crazy for this team, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, would you, uh, would you all stand up now? And uh, you know what? I need to apologize to you because I meant to say that by standing up, you have now joined the Shakopee team, okay? That's the deal. Are you good with that? This is, this is what we're doing together. And we're going to pray one more time because I'm going to bless you folks in this effort. And then the team is going out right by the fountain. Go out after, the, after worship. And love them up and hug them and say, what can we do to partner with you? And by the way, you'll, you'll see some magnets out there. You got friends in Shakopee? Invite them. Get them there. Let me pray with you. Lord, we, we now stand together as one. And we're going to move as one, Lord. This is all about this church, Hosanna, uh, going to a, a new community. And we're excited about it. Lord, you have prepared this. You've opened up the door. And so our simple ask, Lord, our simple prayer is that all that we do there might bring you glory and advance your kingdom and we ask it in the unmatched powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. They're walking off now to go to the fountain and go out there and greet him. Just receive this blessing folks. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you. Amen. Have a marvelous week. <laughs>